about a year before um, COVID happened, I started feeling really unwell and life was just so busy. I'd go to the doctor for the occasional blood test. They'd say, look, it's all clear. You're fine. I had some other chronic health conditions like endometriosis and some other things. So I just put it down to that. And then obviously when we were all in lockdown, I had time to focus. It's time to really look into what tests haven't been done. So I asked my doctor for a list of all my bloods. I went through them and slowly but surely I saw that my calcium had been repeatedly high over years, maybe two or three years. My doctor at this time was saying, you know, I'm having loads of patients at the moment that have health anxiety. This is what's coming out from the pandemic. You know, I really believe that that's what's going on for you. Luckily, because I'd asked for my results and I saw this repeated high, high calcium, I realized there was definitely something up and I found out about hyperparathyroidism. I actually paid privately because obviously in the UK, we have the NHS, got a scan of my thyroid and my parathyroid. They said, oh, there's an unusual lymph node going on there but they didn't think to check it out but they said look yeah you've got a tumor on your parathyroid we need to get that out went off to find this other amazing endocrinologist up in Oxford he did the surgery and that's where he found a black lymph node during my surgery and within a week he'd called me up and said sorry to let you know but you've got thyroid cancer part of the reason why I sacked my previous endocrinologist was that he had seen the lymph node but he was just determined to get this parathyroid tumor out he didn't biopsy the nodules in my thyroid. He said, oh yeah, you've got some nodules. But as it happens, I had on the left-hand side, one that was as big as 3.4 centimeters. And on the right, I had five nodules. And on the right-hand side, I had the papillary thyroid cancer. I just knew my body and I knew there was something not right. So I just thought I'm going to keep pushing for answers. I know there's something out of balance here. I went and had biopsies. And in England, normally if it's under one centimeter, they don't tend to biopsy, right. but they knew from the lymph node that they had to biopsy all of those ones. And we didn't know if it was in the left or right. Lymph node was found in the right-hand side, but they did the biopsy on all of them because some of them were as small as two millimeters. And oh, the yeah. one that they actually found the papillary thyroid cancer in was four millimeters. Some of them came back atypical. So on the left-hand side, my larger one, which has now gone from 3.4 to 1.1, did come back as atypical cells. So there is a chance it could be follicular. But there's a kind of 10 to 20% chance. Did you have genetic testing done to determine that? I did have the genetic testing to make sure I didn't have the BRCA. BRAF, I think. is what Yeah, it? yeah, BRAF, that's it. Yeah, um, BRAF. I don't know in the UK what these companies are. In the US, there's ThyroSeq and there's a Firma testing that they can do to determine a percentage of risk of, uh, of cancer. So like when you said 20 to 30% risk of cancer, it made me wonder if that was the same type of, te of testing. Just my endocrinologist said, you know, depending on how it looks mm -hmm. and how it responds. And he said from the atypical cells, they just give you a rough estimate and that's usually anything between 10% and 30%. It sounds like maybe what he's referring to is the Bethesda categories, maybe, which is basically how it looks on ultrasound. What are yeah. the, what are the qualities of it? You know, the shape, exactly. the size, exactly. is it smooth around the outside? So once you've had an RFA treatment, those were treated with RFA, correct? Yes, all of them were. Okay. So yeah. once you've had an RFA treatment, the nodule may have started off as this very smooth, lighter gray color. And, mm. and once you treat it with heat, think about if you use a wood burning tool, what happens to that wood? It gets dark. It may lose its smoothness. It may get irregular. It may get a funny shape as it starts to shrink and draw in on itself. For example, for my nodules, when I had my follow-up ultrasound, they looked like cancer after they had been ablated. Oh, wow. And so if I were to go to a doctor who does not know that I've had RFA, they would be very concerned by looking at my nodules. My provider who actually did the RFA, who knows what it looked like before, he knows that it was confirmed benign by two biopsies. We know that it's not changed just because of the RFA. And so that's yeah. why annual follow-up is important. And you'll have yeah. continued follow-up to see if there are changes because if your nodules suddenly start growing, mm. you know, okay, the cancer is growing and maybe you need to consider surgery at that point. Yeah. If it continues shrinking and if there are no changes that increase in size, mm -hmm. you're in good shape. Going back to what you were saying, sounds to me like he was just evaluating your nodules based on their visible appearance on ultrasound. Exactly. 
Yeah. So, and it's still think, felt like it was favorable. Yeah. And the fact that it's had, you know, a good amount of shrinkage since a year ago when I had my RFA to now. So it's gone down to 1.1. He said, you know, it's promising because the last time we tested, we've, we've done two scans since the RFA. So right after about a month after RFA and six months later, and then on Monday, he said, you know, it's looking amazing. There's literally no scar tissue at all on the right hand side whatsoever and that was five nodules done i'm over the moon to have found rfa i am so so glad because the uh, last thing i wanted when i found out you know the options were you're going to have a, a thyroidectomy and then you're going to have radioactive iodine and i thought firstly i have a son that needs me around thought of not being around for my kids isolating for 30 days possibly for two rounds i just thought i just don't want to do this mm -hmm. so i was so glad for the pandemic so i had all this time on my hands to research all the options available to me the problem i had was because it had spread into one of my lymph nodes no one wanted to treat me because they said really it's it's too tricky you know you're not really a candidate for rfa but i knew that my lymph nodes were looking good you know i'd had that black one removed luckily dr caucasus was the only person that would take me on i think i emailed maybe eight different doctors around the world and then i saw your interview who's the canadian guy cyrus yeah, Cyrus. Yeah. And I was like, oh my goodness, our stories are so similar. He had a very small papillary cancer and, and he said it was completely gone afterwards. And that's just amazing. Yeah. I mean, my four millimeter one was completely gone. All the right-hand side, everything was gone straight away. If this one on the left-hand side does grow, I will go back to have radiofrequency ablation again, mm -hmm. because I've seen how easy and effective it is. You know, the fact that you don't even have to have an anesthetic, you lie down on the table, they do it and you get up. And, you know, in my case, I flew home. It's just That's amazing. Wonderful. What you're dealing with was kind of outside of the normal boundaries of what is typically treated with RFA in, in cancer cases. Mm. The fact that that lymph node that you had that was black was surgically removed. Mm. You had the parathyroid surgery. Mm -hmm. I wonder if maybe that is reason for Dr. Kursu's taking you as a patient for RFA because knowing that that was surgically removed, you do probably have some scar tissue from that surgery, a subsequent surgery, a little yeah. bit more difficult. Exactly. It also means that that lymph node was completely eliminated. I mean, there's always a risk for micro microscopic spread with surgery. Yeah. That's why you need the follow-ups, but it's gone. It's not still there potentially going to grow. And so, you know, there's a little bit more of a definitive situation with what you have than someone who has never had a neck surgery before. It was a bigger risk than most people that have RFA for thyroid cancer. And I was willing to take that on. I knew the consequences would be that maybe I would have to have a thyroidectomy with radioactive iodine. But I thought if it gives me a little bit more time, a year to five years, I'll be really happy with that. And as it happens, I feel really hopeful. Yes. The, the biggest benefit of RFA in these kinds of situations is that it is not burning a bridge. It's not permanent in the sense that you can't have a surgery afterwards. It's not a choice between one or the other. It's yeah. just another step in that road that you may not go past that step, but if you need to, you can. This is exciting. I'm glad you're doing so well. Oh, thank you. And thank you to you. If it wasn't for finding your videos, I'd never have done it. With you knowing that this is papillary thyroid cancer, that that makes you aware of the fact that it doesn't typically spread to other organs. Typically papillary stays in the thyroid. So, you know, with you continually following up, being aware of any changes, that will keep you in the know about if it's spread and if you need to pursue any further treatment down the road. Very survivable cancer, 98% survival. Exactly, rate. exactly. So, you know, while I would never ever go so far as to say that it is a good cancer because no cancer is good, it is a favorable outcome for yeah. the majority of patients. And I think it's so easy when you hear that diagnosis that you have cancer to absolutely panic and just think, get this thing out. But yeah. my God, I am so glad that I didn't. Do. Wonderful to catch these things early enough that you can treat them and preserve yeah. the thyroid gland because we do know the thyroid gland is, is very important.